Here we're going to talk about some of the properties of the graph of the cosecant function. So it's going to be pretty similar to uh, the video where we talked about the properties of the uh, secant graph, and so that's a previous video. Um, so anyway, we're going to start with the domain. Okay, so uh, a couple videos ago we talked about uh, how to get this graph um, from basically just from transformations of the secant graph. Um, so we talked about that. And uh, here we're going to talk about some of the properties. So uh, the domain, um, remember the domain is the set of all the values that x is allowed to be. So we have y equals the cosecant of x. Here's the graph. Um, the, the domain is the set of all the values that x is allowed to be. So before we continue with that, um, let's write down that cosecant of x equals 1 over the sine of x. Okay. So basically, um, we talked about this quite a few times now. Um, the domain is basically everywhere except where sine of x equals 0. Okay, so all values of x except the values of x that make sine equal to 0. Okay, so the reason is um, sine of x by itself has no domain restrictions. Okay, so you can take the sine of any number you want. But here cosecant is 1 divided by the sine, so uh, sine of x is not allowed to be 0 for the cosecant to actually be defined. Okay? So the domain is basically uh, all real x except for except for the zeros uh, of sine. And remember, zeros, it's a pre-calculus or college algebra term that just means, uh, so a zero of a function is a value of x that makes the function equal to zero. So for example, uh, sine of pi is zero, sine of two pi is zero, sine of zero is zero, sine of negative pi is zero, sine of negative two pi is zero. So all five of these numbers here, zero, pi, negative pi, two pi, negative two pi, those are all zeros of the sine function. Okay? So all real x is for the zeros of sine. And what do we see at these values of x? We see that the cosecant function is in fact not defined at these values of x. Okay, it's defined, uh, or it's, what we have there are vertical asymptotes instead. Okay, so the cosecant function is defined everywhere else, okay, but at those uh, zeros of the sine function, 0 pi, negative pi, 2 pi, negative 2 pi, 3 pi, negative 3 pi, so on and so forth, uh, we have vertical asymptotes there. Okay, so um, the domain is all real x except for the zeros of sine. So this um, is how we say it in English, in words here. How do we say it mathematically? Well, just like we've done uh, a few times before now, um, it's going to be the set of all x such that uh, x does not equal k pi, where k is any integer. <clears throat> okay, so basically, this is just a really short way of uh, saying an infinite list. So it's uh, if k is 0, then k pi is 0. If k is 1, then k pi is 1 pi, or just pi. If k is 2, k pi is 2 pi. Okay? So 0, 1 times pi, 2 pi. If k is negative 1, you'll have negative pi. If k is negative 2, you'll have negative 2 pi. If k is 3, you'll have 3 pi, somewhere over here. Okay? Uh, and then 4, 4 pi. k is 5, you'll have 5 pi. If k is 6, you'll have 6 pi, and so on and so forth. Okay? So the domain is all real values of x except for these values. Okay, because at these values of x, at k pi, where k is any integer, at these values of x, sine of x is 0, and then if sine is 0, you're dividing by 0, which is not allowed, so cosecant will not be defined there. Okay, so the domain is everything except those values of x. Okay, how about the range? Oh, it's also worth pointing out that this is the exact same domain as uh, the cotangent function, because cotangent is cosine divided by sine. Okay, so cotangent and cosecant have the same denominator, so they have the same domain, because there's no other restrictions for either one of them. Okay. All right, how about the range? So the range is actually going to be the same as the secant graph, but in case you didn't see that video, we'll talk about it again briefly here. So first, what we need to do, though, is label these points. So uh, this right here is going to be pi over 2, comma 1. This right here is going to be uh, 3 pi over 2, comma negative 1. Okay, so that's uh, 3 pi over 2. This is uh, negative pi over 2, comma negative 1. And then this right here, uh, this point right here is negative 3 pi over 2, comma positive 1. Oops. Okay, that's a 2 also. All right, terrible labels. So um, okay, how do we know that? Well, just you know, from plotting points, we know these, these are also kind of like points on the unit circle. So pi over 2, we know that's a nice number on the unit circle. Um, sine of pi over 2 is 1, so the cosecant of pi over 2 is also 1. Um, sine of 3 pi over 2 is negative 1, so the cosecant of 3 pi over 2 is also negative 1, and so on. But also, if we think about it as shifts from the secant graph, 
So if you take the secant graph and shift it like we did a couple of videos ago, um, then the points will shift you know, this way and then we'll end up with uh, pi over 2 comma 1, 3 pi over 2 comma negative 1, negative pi over 2 comma negative 1, negative 3 pi over 2 comma 1, and so on and so forth. Okay, but we don't really want to dwell on that too much because it's not really uh, it's sort of a side topic away from the main point here. So the main point though that we want to focus on is what are the y coordinates? Okay, y is negative 1 here, um, negative 1 here, it's positive 1 here, positive 1 here. So if we look at these two pieces here, we see that uh, if you're on positive 1, y equals positive 1, or anywhere above, okay, then you're going to have some piece of the graph there somewhere. Okay? So if you start at positive 1, y equals positive 1, no matter how far up you go, you can go up as far as you want, um, you're still going to have a piece of the graph there somewhere. Okay, so what that means is that uh, every value of y greater than or equal to negative 1 is part of the range. Because no matter how far up you go in the positive y direction, uh, as long as you're above y equals 1, then no matter how far up you go, you're going to have a piece of the graph there. So uh, the function is going to be defined up there. It's going to have a y value no matter how far up you go above negative 1. Same thing uh, because these arrows here mean go infinitely far up, infinitely far up. And these two arrows mean the same thing, infinitely far up and infinitely far up. Okay? So, and it's the same thing down here in the negative direction. So for y equals negative 1 uh, here and here, um, no matter how far down you go below that, you're always going to have some piece of the graph there. Okay? So no matter how far down you go, um, all these y values down here, they are part of the range because the graph just goes infinitely far down. And these two arrows mean the graph goes infinitely far down. Okay? So um, no matter how far down you go below negative 1, Okay, part of the graph will be there. Okay, so there's going to be some value of x that's going to give you uh, the y value down here that you're looking at. So no matter how far down you go, you're going to get some y value, and there's always going to be an x um, value that gives you that y value. Okay, so basically, um, we get all the y values that are 1 or larger than 1. We get all the y values that are negative 1 or below negative 1, but we don't get anything in between. Okay, so for example, what if we wanted to get like a y value of 1 half? Okay, well, y value of 1 half would be right here, but if you look all the way out to the right and all the way out to the left, you'll see that the graph never touches the uh, y equals 1 half. Okay, so there's no value of x that makes cosecant of x equal to 1 half. Same thing is true with negative 1 half and 0 and so on. Okay, so um, basically the range is everything except in between negative 1 and 1, but the way we say that mathematically, um, there's a couple different ways, but the best way is uh, with interval notation like this, um, best way depending on who you talk to I guess, but interval notation is pretty standard. So negative infinity to negative 1, square bracket on the negative 1 because it is part of the range. Okay, remember square bracket means include that endpoint and always do round parenthesis on infinity and negative infinity. And then we say union square bracket positive 1 comma positive infinity. Okay, so that's our range. So negative infinity to negative 1, that covers pieces like this down here. Okay, so that's um, from uh, negative 1 all the way down below to negative infinity. So from negative infinity all the way up to negative 1, and including negative 1, that means this piece right here. Okay? And then these two pieces right here, and also infinitely many more pieces because of the periodic property, which we'll talk about soon. Um, so everything at y equals 1 and above y equals 1, greater, so at y equals 1 and greater, um, is also part of the range. So that's this right here, y equals 1 and greater, 1 all the way up to infinity. Okay? So that's the range. Um, how about the period? So the period, relatively straightforward. We've actually talked about it before. We've used it before um, when we were evaluating cosecant at certain uh, values of x, things like that. So the period is just 2 pi, okay? Um, because cosecant of x is 1 over sine of x, the period of sine is 2 pi. So if you take the reciprocal, that doesn't change anything at all with the period. So cosecant of x is still uh, going to have the same period, 2 pi. Hey, we see that on the graph, right? So from here to here, that's 0 to 2 pi. This uh, right here is one complete cycle of the graph. Okay, this, this piece with this piece and these three asymptotes, x equals 0, x equals pi, x equals 2 pi, that's one complete cycle. Okay? So if we go 2 pi units to the left, here's uh, another complete cycle. Okay, it's the same exact piece, or it would, it's supposed to be the same exact, but if I, uh, and it would be if I were able to draw it a little better. But you see it's piece up here, piece down here. So one complete cycle. Move to the left, same exact piece, same exact shape right there. Okay, this shape here, this shape here, three asymptotes. Um, and then if we move two pi units to the right, we're going to have the same shape there. Okay, piece up here, another asymptote, and a piece down here, and another asymptote. And we can move two pi units to the right again. Piece up here, asymptote, piece down here, asymptote, and so on and so forth. Okay, so infinitely far to the right and infinitely far to the left, uh, this shape is going to keep repeating. Okay, so piece up here, asymptote, piece down here, asymptote. 
and so on and so forth, and asymptote right here too. Okay, so that's uh, the period. Next, let's talk about uh, vertical asymptotes, so VA for short. Okay, so um, now just like, uh, so there's a lot of parallelisms and similarities going on here. So vertical asymptotes, uh, in general, they're kind of defined by the denominator. So uh, our denominator here is sine. So basically the vertical asymptotes are, uh, they're going to happen where for sine of x equals zero. Okay, we talked about that a little bit with the domain. And also it's pretty much the exact same concept as with the secant graph and the cotangent graph and the tangent graph. Okay, wherever the denominator is zero, uh, as long as the top is not also zero, which won't happen here because the top is just one, then what you'll have is a vertical asymptote. Okay. Um, so vertical asymptotes, uh, they are lines, so we have to express them using the equation of a line. So that's going to be x equals uh, k pi, where k is any integer. Okay, so notice uh, this is everything that we're excluding from the domain, right? The domain is all x such that x does not equal k pi. Well, what if x does equal k pi? Then you have vertical asymptotes, okay? So notice uh, this is the exact same set of vertical asymptotes. Um, they're, they're the exact same asymptotes we have for the cotangent function because cotangent has the same denominator okay? and nothing else is happening that uh, would restrict the vertical asymptotes at all. Okay? So remember, if the top and bottom are zero at the same time, if the numerator and denominator are zero at the same time, then the graph actually has a hole, not a vertical asymptote. But we don't have to worry about that here okay? because here it's one over sine of x. Uh, the top is never zero. All right, and then for cotangent, uh, cosine of x and sine of x, they're not zero at the same time. Okay, so cotangent and cosecant, they have the same vertical asymptotes. Okay? And they happen at the zeros of the sine function, so that's worth writing down. So these are the uh, zeros of sine. Okay, so that's vertical asymptotes. Uh, how about x-intercepts? So x-intercepts, uh, just like with the secant graph, it's actually going to be relatively straightforward. <clears throat> okay, with x-intercepts, so remember, an x-intercept is a point where you're on the x-axis. Whether you touch it and turn around or if you cross it, doesn't matter. As long as you're on the x-axis, that's an x-intercept. Uh, it's a point where y equals zero. Well, that never happens here, right? Because we, we can even see in the range, uh, zero is not part of the range. So there's no value of x that makes cosecant of x equal to zero. So since y is never zero for y equals cosecant of x, it's never, y is never zero. So um, we're never on the x-axis. So there are no x-intercepts, okay? No x-intercepts. Okay, none. Um, just like with the secant graph, actually. With the secant function, there's also no x-intercepts because the secant function has the same range. Okay. Um, okay. And since the range excludes the value 0, then there's no value of x that gives you a y value of 0. All right, now how about the y-intercept? So remember, a function can only have at most one y-intercept. Otherwise, you're on the y-axis twice, and you fail the vertical line test, and you're not a function. So that's why we say y-intercept, singular. Um, okay, so y-intercepts, so just like an x-intercept is a point where you're on the x-axis, which we don't have any here, um, a y-intercept is a point where you're on the y-axis, okay? So are we ever on the y-axis? Well, no, notice the y-axis is a vertical asymptote. Okay, x equals zero, that is the y-axis. Um, it's a vertical asymptote. So uh, the graph of the function itself is never going to be on the y-axis because you can never, ever, ever touch a vertical asymptote or you never cross a vertical asymptote, nothing like that. Okay, so a graph of a function can never touch its own vertical asymptote. Um, so there is no value of x that puts you, or uh, rather, rather what we should say is there's no value of y anywhere on the y-axis. So um, if you plug in x equals zero, it's just undefined, okay? So remember, if you're on the y-axis, then x automatically equals zero, but x is not allowed to be zero, okay? Because that's actually not part of the domain. Also, so we can think of it like that. So we can look at the domain or we can look at the graph. So in the domain, x is not allowed to be k pi, where k is any integer. Well, if k is 0, then uh, x then k pi is going to be 0 pi, which is just 0. So x is not allowed to be 0. Okay? It's excluded from the domain. Um, and we see that on the graph right here. If x is 0, then we have a vertical asymptote. So um, very, very, very lengthy way of saying uh, no y-intercept, okay? none. No x-intercepts, no y-intercepts. 
what a ridiculous function. Okay, so x intercept, y intercept. Um, now it's probably worth mentioning that just like with the secant and the tangent and the cotangent, uh, there is no concept of amplitude. Okay, so remember, sines and cosines, wavy things like that, they have amplitude, right? They have amplitude, but uh, secants and cosecants and tangents and cotangents don't have amplitude. So it does not make sense at all to talk about amplitude of a cosecant graph or amplitude of a cosecant function, things like that. It just doesn't make sense. It does not apply to them. Okay. Um, sort of similarly, uh, it's probably not a good idea to talk about phase shift with cosecants because uh, just like we mentioned in the tangent and cotangent and secant videos, um, phase shift, most people use that to talk about waves, so things like sines and cosines. Um, but remember, phase shift is just a fancy term for horizontal shift, so people will probably know what you're talking about, um, but just be careful about that. So um, it's probably safest just to talk about horizontal shift, left and shift left and shift right. So instead of saying phase shift with cosecants, just talk about a horizontal shift. Uh, it might be a little bit better, or a little safer anyway. All right, so then the last thing to talk about here um, which might come as no surprise, uh, cosecant is an odd function. Okay, we actually have talked about that before. We've used that property before to evaluate cosecant at various values of x. Um, and what this means algebraically, uh, just like the tangent and cotangent functions, what it means algebraically is uh, cosecant of negative x equals negative cosecant of x. Okay. So be careful, it's not like factoring, we're not factoring out a negative one, we're not pulling out a negative one, it's just a property of odd functions that's kind of nice. Okay, and actually another way of expressing it is uh, negative cosecant of negative x equals plain old cosecant of x. Okay, so sometimes it's more useful in that form, sometimes more useful in this form. Um, you can express it either way though in general. So anyway, that's what it means algebraically. What does it mean geometrically or graphically? Well, we've talked about it a few times now with tangent and cotangent and otherwise kind of. Um, it just means that uh, if, you're, if you're an odd function, then your graph is symmetric over the origin. Okay? So what does it mean to be symmetric over the origin? That means if you reflect over the y-axis and then over the x-axis, um, you're gonna get that piece back. Okay? So if we take this piece right here, I take this piece, reflect it over the y-axis, what are we gonna get? We'll take this, flip it over the y-axis, okay, reflect it over the y-axis there, we're gonna get a piece like this right here, okay? Kind of sort of something like that. If I knew how to draw better. Anyway, so we'll get a piece like that here, okay? And then, so here's our piece reflected over the y-axis. Now take this, reflect over the x-axis. So if we reflect this piece right here that we just made, reflect over the x-axis, then we're gonna get exactly this piece right here, okay? So this is the same thing is true here. If you take this piece, reflect over the um, y-axis, what are you gonna get? Okay, so reflect this over the y-axis, you're gonna get this piece right here, right? Kind of sort of something like that. And then um, take this piece and reflect it over the x-axis and you're gonna get exactly this piece right here, okay? So that's all it means to be uh, symmetric over the origin. Just reflect over y, reflect over x, or you could reflect over x first and then over y, it doesn't matter. Um, but then once you do that, reflect over both axes, you're gonna get just a mirror image of that piece basically. Okay, so reflect this over here, get that. Reflect over the x-axis, you'll get that, uh, another piece of the graph. Okay, so reflect over y, reflect over x, and you'll get another piece of the graph is what that means. Um, okay, so that's it for the properties of the cosecant graph. So domain, range, period, um, vertical asymptotes, um, x-intercepts, y-intercepts, no concept of amplitude, best to avoid talking about phase shifts, uh, just use horizontal shift, and cosecant is an odd function.